Software Engineering Radio, Episode 79, Small Memory Software. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, yet another episode of Software Engineering Radio. This episode is part of our embedded series and we're going to talk about small memory software. Um, before we introduce our uh, guests or interviewees, uh, I'd just like to say a quick thanks to Six Data.com, the organizers of the OOP conference, because they gave us this neat little room here where we can record stuff in a quiet atmosphere as part of the OOP 2007 conference. Um, it's actually not easy to get these kinds of rooms at conferences because everybody wants one, so it's really cool that we actually got one. So um, welcome, Charles and James, um, to the SE Radio podcast. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little, about a, a little bit about your background? Hello, I'm Charles Weir. I run a small software development house in the north of England, Penrillion, and uh, small but expanding. And we specialize in software for mobile phones. My background was as a consultant in object technology, uh, teaching and uh, working with people when in the days when C++ and Java were still a really new concept. <laughs> and um, as part of that, I did a lot of work with Symbian as a technical lead. And when James and I were casting around for something to write a book on, we realized that one thing that we really shared was small memory this having worked with small machines and working with small machines over to james i'm james noble um, i'm professor of computer science at victoria university of wellington in new zealand and in fact for the last uh, few months now i've been on sabbatical in europe i'm currently a uh, academic visitor at microsoft research in cambridge mm. which is certainly an interesting place to be and um, as Charles said, I worked with Charles on design patterns for a number of years, and we thought that there was important best practice, the kind of things that programmers do and that programmers have been doing for a number of years, that in some ways was being lost to um, the object-oriented community mm -hmm. um, with the emergence of lots yeah. of small devices like that rather neat uh, recorder you've got yep. there, Marcus. Um, issues of memory size really don't go away. Uh, even as the technology continues improving, and we are interested in documenting and making that practice available uh, to developers more generally. In fact, I've been finding, when, when we first wrote the book, we believed that we were talking about something that was, if not obsolete, it was rapidly becoming <laughs> something that nobody would be interested yep. in. We did it for the fun of it. Actually, as I've been... Um, you know, giving talks on the subject, I'm finding that far from being obsolete, this is more and more becoming mainstream. Small memory software yeah. is becoming something that, that I get bigger and bigger audiences for. And it is, you know, ubiquitous computing and many yeah. millions of small machines is something that, that is becoming mainstream. So you wrote the book when? In which year? Uh, we actually published it in 2000. Right. And now we have 2007 and you're invited to the OOP conference and to talk about small memory. So that's kind of one of the proofs uh, that the small memory stuff is not getting obsolete. Exactly. Okay. So what is small memory software? I would say it is anything, any software, where the memory size, be it disk or RAM, is a consideration. Mm -hmm. Now, it's surprising how many... How many situations that is actually not true you know most most uh, workstation applications mm. really running out of memory can be considered completely fatal you don't have to worry about it if it happens something's gone horribly wrong yeah but in in any environment with less than about a meg available megabyte of memory available for processing mm -hmm. it's quite likely that you'll have to think a little bit about memory management Certainly all of the Symbian devices we work with, certainly anything embedded, yep. certainly anything with, with its own software that's produced in the millions, is going to have somebody saying, well, what if we made the memory slightly smaller? Yeah, it, that's this typical effect in embedded software that you don't necessarily have the development cost as the driving factor, but the per unit production cost. So better optimize the software for one more year, paying people, and get the amount of memory lowered. Right. 
There's another interesting um, but relatively small application area where, once again, we found these te techniques being used, and it's a bit of a surprising one, which is in systems that are doing an awful lot of processing. So, funnily enough, people doing batch processing on mainframes, or in certain cases doing scientific computation, also have problems with memory. Mm -hmm. um, for the mainframe stuff, it's because once you're trying to do millions of transactions a minute, um, you simply can't afford to allocate very much CPU or very much memory to each individual transaction. Yeah. Uh, Dave Thomas from OTI once described the sort of big IBM mainframes as, you know, just very, very big embedded computers, very, very big <laughs> embedded systems. Yeah. Uh, and the other one are people doing scientific computing. If you're doing genomics or some of the grid stuff, I mean, mm. it doesn't really matter if you've only got, you know, two gigabytes of memory shared amongst 16 sun cores if the amount of data you're trying to handle is really, really huge. And this yeah. was one of the surprising things we found that – uh, and I think it's one of the things that patents can do quite well, is recognize the real problem here is dealing with memory limitations. As Charles says, if you're programming and you have to care about memory, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter if you're working on a very small machine mm -hmm. and trying mm -hmm. to, you know, trying to fit a little bit more data in than you've got, or even if you're working a very big machine, because chances are you may be dealing with huge amounts of, uh, of data. Yep. So it's, it's somewhat ironic in that it's the desktop applications are the odd ones out because typically in the desktop applications, one of the defining characteristics there is you know, one. we're willing to just ignore the fact that we might run out of memory. Basically, we'll page to the disk, and if the mm -hmm. disk falls up, fills up on your laptop, well, you're basically you go out and buy a new one. You know? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Although, if the disk fills up with only paging, there might be a more systematic error. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you go out and you buy and uh, buy a new dual core laptop. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> one should distinguish, of course, memory leaks, which are an issue for almost mm. every environment, from this kind of small memory software. Which reminds me, what was that question you asked Charles at the start of his interview about what his laptop was doing? Oh, yeah, it showed a blue screen, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Wow. We, we've done um, interviews about like patterns books before, and the way we've done this typically, and I think which works quite well, is that we first give an overview over the different like parts, chapters, sections in the book that cover different kinds of patterns, different areas of concern, and then we dig into the areas and uh, look at some of the patterns in more detail. So let's do that too. Let's um, briefly scan over the different aspects of where you can actually be aware of memory and what you should and can do. The separation into categories is, is really something we did after we wrote the patterns. Yeah, so doesn't matter. <laughs> think of these, think of these as, as chapters. And the simple one to start with is small data structures. So designing your code, designing your data structures so that they don't take up too much space. Mm. That, that's also the obvious thing people think about when exactly. they think about small memory systems. Exactly. Then we started looking at memory allocation, which is the different ways you can, you can allocate memory, be it fixed, pooled, yeah. variable. Yeah. Um, there's a whole section that is slightly more in the, the region of application functionality, which is using compression. Um, mm -hmm. various different types of compression. Then, if you're in an environment with secondary storage, disk or anything else, mm -hmm. then there are a variety of different ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, there's a sort of overview in the way you architect the system, which we've called small architecture, um, a set of techniques that you can use to make a, a whole application or an application environment work well in... Um, in a small memory situation. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that you, and now then we talk about these things that you almost uh, uh, mentioned the chapters backwards. It was four, five, three, two, one. So <laughs> um, <laughs> does the book have the wrong order, or why did you why did you mention them in the other direction? I mentioned them the other way because of experience teaching. <laughs> If you uh -huh. you know, I liked I. When you're when you're writing a book, in a sense, you you sort of start from the most abstract, mm -hmm. the most interesting, and work towards the detail. Mm -hmm. um, when you're teaching, you start with something that everybody can grasp, mm -hmm. and then work out to say, oh, and by the way, this is part of a bigger story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, but I suppose were Alison Wesley to come and offer us a second edition, <laughs> clearly the way we would make a, a valuable difference to the book is that by just changing the chapter order. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's look at some of the small data structure patterns. 
Oh, well, shall we start off with my, my favorite little packed data, mm -hmm. which is very simple. We call it bit munging. Mm -hmm. you, if, you have, if you have a lot of data which can be compressed, normalized, whatever it might be, you just take it and you pack it into a small number of bits, and that way you can store an awful lot more than you would if you used full bytes, pointers, and the whole the whole gamut of normal fast programming. No. So I, uh, as an illustration, we considered how you would get an entire telephone directory into a couple of megabytes. Mm -hmm. And with a certain amount of normalization, storing, figuring out what telephone numbers actually look like and using, the, using features of that, you can do it. The obvious example, I think, is that uh, typically Booleans, I think, are stored as bytes, although they only contain one bit of information. So that would be one thing of compressing significantly. Well, right. And, and if you're in, uh, in Java, it'll probably store it as a word or something. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you know, it's got to be an instance of the class. The trade-off is obviously that working with this stuff is much more complicated than using the simpler data structures. Yeah, you're right. And in some sense, though, one of the things we point out in the pattern is the way in which effectively by either using macros or accessor functions, right, depending right, right, on your right. language, um, you can try and abstract that away so yep. that the, um, the packing, the data representation doesn't sort of infect the rest of the yep. code that you're writing. Yep. Yes, in fact, we, we typically recomm we recommend that you have a class that wraps the packed data, right. and so the class is used the same as if it was not packed, yep. and it's an implementation detail of that class as to how it actually stores it. So this is interesting that um, even if you're doing Java, which you, you might be on a mobile phone, you can still use bit-level packing um, because what you do is you basically use bit operations on standard Java integers um, to put the information in and that, and you can, you can have a Java class to, to do things that way. Yeah, but I'm just think, thinking about this. If you have a wrapper class, actually, and you have this bit structure that c captures a number of Booleans, and then you have a function that wraps it, that returns a Boolean, you, of course, still have a transient Boolean object created. So you do have an efficient storage, but you have this temporary Boolean big, big object that's passed around. That's right. And it's built into Java already, of course. Yeah. You have these capital int classes wrapping something that's actually only a four-byte integer. Yeah. Um, another thing I might mention is if you look on the website, smallmemory.com, we have the sample code that went into the book. Mm -hmm. So there is an example of Java bit packing there, as indeed of most of the other patterns. Okay, let's look at the next one. The next one, I guess, if we're walking through small data structures, is sharing. And once again, this is another very straightforward idea, straightforward pattern, which says if you have a common information used in more than one place, um, rather than duplicating it in your program, uh, you just share it. Um, you store it once and then get it from whatever context that you want. Yeah, although this creates the whole problems of uh, concurrent access if you're in a concurrent program. So, so I'm saying the, the concurrency concern works against this because that would you, you would have like non-shared data and replication, ideally. Right. So the first question is, you know, what do you do if you want to change the data typically? Mm -hmm. So if you've got concurrent read accesses, you're going to be all right. Right, no problem. Um, which in some sense segues nicely onto the next pattern, which is copy on write. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So if you are sharing stuff, I mean, essentially one of the things the sharing pattern says is, you know, you can certainly share stuff that's immutable. Mm -hmm. How then do you change the stuff you're sharing? Okay, well, maybe you provide copy on write, yeah. which is nice because it can give you the illusion of having uh, every part of the system having their own private um, modifiable data structures. But in fact, you're only going to use the memory when you actually need to, when you actually make that change. Yeah, which is a form of kind of lazy acquisition of memory, which we'll discuss later, I guess. Right, yeah, we will, because there are situations where that's, that is wise, and there are situations where perhaps you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. My favorite amongst the small data structures is multiple representations, mm -hmm. which is where you have one class or interface, and it, and it chooses internally the best representation, the most memory-efficient representation for the particular application. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, in Symbian, I remember the editor... Um, has two modes where it either does it is either just just formats the bit it's going to display or it or it sometimes formats the whole lot all mm -hmm. of the text it's mm -hmm. displaying mm -hmm. and that really depends on how much memory is required and how big the text is mm -hmm. and it makes that decision on the fly so there are multiple representations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that's quite fun, but obviously it's a lot of implementation yeah. effort to do it. Yeah. But that's to some extent probably true for all of these things. Whenever you optimize for any kind of non-functional concern, then you always have to have trade-offs with regards to the usability, the programming model, and the convenience. Certainly, yes. Yeah. Shall we move on to memory allocation? Right. Which was a much bigger topic than it appeared at first, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the most interesting one from a point of view of embedded and small systems is fixed allocation. Yeah. This is um, an interesting thing. So the idea of, I mean, by memory allocation, we mean, you know, in, in, in um, C, what happens when you call malloc, in some mm-hmm. sense, what malloc is doing behind itself, or perhaps the question of whether you choose to call, call malloc at all or you get the memory some other way. Mm. And fixed allocation basically says make an array of, of objects or of, um, of structs or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever you need to allocate at the start of your program before the program really does any work. Mm-hmm. Um, so that if, you know, this means that if your operating environment doesn't have enough memory to allocate that array, your program simply won't launch. So this is, I mean, as the title says, this is not a pattern to actually make things smaller and save memory. It is a way of handling memory to achieve some other goal. Well, what's the point? Why doing? Why do? Why do we do this? Well, that's that's a really interesting point. Um, this is what we were arguing about yesterday. That's right, and I've nearly got over the Williams Biena. <laughs> the thing is, there is a real conflict here, and and this pattern, and essentially, that it that's shown most sharply in in these memory allocation patterns, and then funnily enough in the highest level patterns, the ones that are first in the book on small architecture, Mm -hmm. um, which also have interesting behavior. Because the point is, often you think if you are working in a memory-constrained environment, you think what you want to do or might want to do is to minimize the absolute memory footprint of your program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to do the program in such a way that it uses the least memory possible. Yep. The funny thing is that for a lot of these programs... As Charles said right at the beginning, you're in a situation where you care about memory use. In other words, you want to avoid memory memory out situations. You want to give guarantees about memory performance. Yep. And in order to be able to do that, minimizing absolute memory use, funnily enough, is often not the most important thing. Mm. The most important thing is to be able to be predictable yeah. about memory use, to be yep. reliable about memory use. And so what fixed allocation will say is, look, you know, for anything, for, uh, I don't know, the number of speed dial numbers in my mobile phone, right? Um, I'm not just going to call malloc every time I want a new one, yeah, yeah. and then when the malloc eventually fails and there's no memory left, I'll just return an error or stick up a dialog box that says, sorry, I can't store great Auntie Ethel's number uh, because I'm out of memory. What it says is I will decide at the beginning that this is sufficiently important that I'm going to have 10 or 100 slots that I'll allocate all the space that I might need for those slots in the design, right up front in the design of the system. And then the catch is, as a programmer, it is incumbent on me to do a bit more work than calling malloc. You know, so, so what you do is you really explicitly allocate an array, and you have to manage this memory area yourself. And then if somebody asks for a slot, you basically check which array slot is empty, and you return a pointer to that, to that array slot. Is that the way it works? Yes, though it doesn't have to be an array. It could be any data structure. And it's frequently just a single object Mm, of whatever mm, it might mm, be. mm, mm. It's This pattern is particularly important in real-time systems because whatever good things we may say about malloc, one of the problems in virtually every implementation is that it takes an undefined time to do an allocation. Because it manages the data as a linked list or something? Because typically... To be any good, there must be some sort of garbage collection going on at some point. Mm-hmm. And malloc sometimes has to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that, that real-time environments have perfectly good real-time mallocs. Yeah. But in general, most environments don't. And um, so if you actually want to be certain that a certain operation is going to take a certain length of time, you avoid... You, you avoid malloc. And indeed, I came across a small talk implementation of a telephone exchange, mm-hmm. which sounds a bit weird. Yeah. Um, but in fact, they achieved it perfectly well by pre allocating every small talk object they needed. And so they knew for certain how long each operation, how long each call was going to take. It didn't need to be fast. Mm-hmm. It didn't need to be objectively really fast. Yeah. It needed to be a fixed maximum. 
The other, the other place where it's important is when software cannot fail. Mm-hmm. So this is a slightly yeah, different yeah, problem. The satellite. The, the satellite or on your mobile phone, dialing an emergency number, yeah. which as international phone people we all now know is 112. Uh-huh. Um, it's, uh, so when you dial an emergency, the one thing that a telephone manufacturer is really worried about is that you might fail to dial an emergency number die or something of the sort and then sue them for it good point is if you're dead you can't sue him but um. well yes <laughs> you know, will. your ghosts will sue <laughs> yeah. um and and that is uh, that is really quite a terrifying prospect never mind that you're dead so the one thing that the one thing that they avoid is any possibility that that particular operation could mm-hmm. fail mm-hmm. how did they do that They pre-allocate in the phone application all the data structures that are required to handle yeah. that particular operation. Yeah. And, of course, the trade-off is that um, y- if you don't need all the data you actually allocate it, you might, in absolute numbers, need more memory than you would have needed in the best case. So this kind of pattern is especially interesting in cases where you know the, the stuff the application does is somewhat predefined, which is, again, typical for embedded systems. Right. Well, that, that's precisely the point. That's what I mean when I say you're not optimizing the absolute right. yeah. memory yeah. Uh, consumption of your program. What you're doing is trading that off in favor of um, trading it off in favor of predictability. Right. And then, uh, as you go through the patterns to do with memory allocation, there are a number of patterns which do similar things in the sense of making, or perhaps not similar things, but but make that trade off in different places. Which would be variable allocation. Right. Obviously. So, so there's variable allocation that basically says call malloc. And, you know, our advice is, and if you're going to call Malik, make sure it's Doug Lee's Malik, yeah. not, any, <laughs> not any random Malik. Um, and, you know, wearing my professorial hat, um, I will say that, you know, people have actually done a fair amount of research on memory allocators and using Malik. Mm. And that for a lot of situations, it's almost if you don't need predict- predictability, mm. you are going to get as good or better performance by calling a good Malik, which is why I mentioned the, the, the Doug Lee's Malik, DL Malik. Um, than you would from code you're writing yourself, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. unless you're as good at writing memory allocation code as Doug Lee, who's been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. So how is pooled allocation different from fixed allocation? Pooled allocation is halfway, is a halfway house from fixed allocation. It's mm-hmm. saying, I will pre-allocate a number of things um, and keep them in a pool. A pool can extend... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it saves the overhead of of throwing away and reallocating afterwards. So memory, um, what's it called? Memory corruption or not cor- corruption? Um, fragmentation, right? So fragmentation memory fragmentation is something down. it avoids. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And fragmentation right. is a problem because it increases the time malloc needs in order to return something. Because it's a find the free spot of the appropriate size. It does that, and it also can mean that if you want a very large piece of memory, you can. Um, oh yeah, there might not be one. You can lose it. You and have indeed, to reallocate stuff. And indeed, this is this is something we see sometimes on mobile phones with camera applications. Yeah, that there is enough memory to store the photograph, <laughs> but for some reason you can't allocate it. Yeah, and that is because you've got fragmented memory. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So what you then need to do is basically compact the memory. Right. And this is something that, you know, in, in garbage collected languages, or most garbage collected languages these days, I should say, uh, most garbage collectors are compacting garbage collectors, which mm-hmm. essentially means every so often you copy all the allocated memory um, down to one end of the memory, leaving a huge chunk of unallocated memory, all the unallocated mm-hmm. memory uh, at the other end. And you can do this manually in your programs too. Yeah. And, you know, in programs, in, in camera phones, in mobile phones, essentially whenever you have a large object that you need to allocate that has to be contiguous, it's, it's got to be a single block. Mm-hmm. You can't split it up and allocate it into, into a bunch of small mm-hmm. objects. So you can talk about the difference between the maximum amount of memory available to allocate versus the largest single chunk. Yep. And when those numbers start getting very different, mm-hmm. um, this is when you want to start compacting memory. It's the same, same as defragmenting a disk. How, yeah, exa- yeah. How, but a uh, question, how, how do I do this? Um, so 
obviously it's easy to to move one piece of data to another place but the problem is that then all references to this thing are invalid so you'd have to somehow have a way to uh, either have an interaction or notify the users that the pointer he has just has been using is now should point to some some other place so how do we update the pointers to that data area if you relocate it in in, in the in the process of compaction and the simplest way to do that is to just have an indirection right. table so yeah. all your all your pointers are indirect yeah okay there's another way of handling the problem if you're in the sort of environment which doesn't actually support this easily, which is C++ or anything which has fixed memory objects. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is rather if you know that you are going to have large and small objects both allocated, mm-hmm. it is worth being careful to avoid allocating small objects straight after large ones mm-hmm. and then deallocating the large ones. Because if you think about the way that the memory will be actually allocated from the heap, you will find that the small object sitting there will fragment the memory and stop a slightly larger, large object from from being allocated. Mm -hmm. So it's worth, if you are dealing with this, it is worth avoiding intermixing these small and large, or at least thinking of them in terms of a stack and Mm deallocating the small Mm -hmm. ones Mm -hmm. as you go along. Mm -hmm. Which links into a couple of other patterns there. One we've already talked about, pooled allocation, because one way to deal with this is you have a, pu- a, a number of pools for yeah. objects of particular sizes. So they're, they're not specific to the type of the object you use, but rather to its size. So you might have different things that all have the same size, and they would all use the same pool. Yeah, you can you can do it you can do it yeah. both ways depending yeah. on you know how important things like type right. safety is so mm-hmm. in in, mm-hmm. in languages like java you know you can make a pool by just making an array and filling it with however many objects of a particular class mm-hmm. and you know you don't give up the references to them the garbage collector won't take them away and they'll yeah. be sitting there ready for you to reuse whenever you want them yeah. in in c or c++ uh you can go through and yeah you can basically have an array of a particular size and you can um even in C++, I think you can overwrite Operator New yeah, right. in, order to, you know, in, in order to um, return a particular segment out of that array. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just going to briefly add one of my favorites, which is memory discard. I wanted to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> which is, I'm glad you mentioned that, John. <laughs> which, is, which is, if you've got an operation which allocates a fair amount of memory but then basically stops... Um, one one good way to do it is to allocate the memory in its own heap, which could be as simple as just a, a block of bytes from which you just allocate sequentially, mm. um, or it could be a separate heap. And when you've finished, you throw away the entire heap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be that can be a very effective way of managing memory. It means you don't have to go around deallocating all the objects. Yeah. It means that the allocation from the heap can be really fast, um, and it's and it's tidy. Which kind of moved us from man- memory allocation to deallocation. Yeah, um, that's right. And so with any of these things, you do have to deal with deallocation. Right. And in some ways, this idea of memory discard or some sort of region-based system does make the allocation very easy and also yeah. to come back to this other thing very reliable mm-hmm. so um, again with real time systems and funnily enough the Java real time standard the RTSJ has got built in support for it mm-hmm. uh, if you are willing to contort your code in order to, to make use of it mm-hmm. um, there are certainly some issues with the design of RTSJ and, and I think the, the new version coming out in, you know, in another year or so is going to be much better particularly with regards to memory allocation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but the um, the point here is you may have a, a task you want your software to complete and you, you're willing to bound its memory use, you know. And the most important thing to protect the integrity of the whole system mm. is that that ta- task doesn't overflow. You can allocate a memory region for it, basically run the task in that memory region. In some cases, it can be as simple as being, you know, we can just make sure that we've got a megabyte sitting at the end of our stack and then allocate everything on the stack mm. rather than going mm. to the heap. Mm. 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 And then when that task finishes, when the function returns in um, the RTSJ, when you deallocate the method um, that holds the region, all this temporary material just goes away without you having to do anything. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then next time, perhaps around the loop, you reallocate or, in fact, you just have this allocated thing and you just start using it again mm-hmm. from the beginning. 
And that's another very effective way of doing this. So let's, let's briefly touch upon reference counting and garbage, collect, garbage collection, I guess, which are the two primary means, I guess, of uh, managing the deallocation of, of data. Reference counting is something most people are probably familiar with. Mm. It's, it, it's common to, um, well, I've seen it a lot in string implementations, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, you keep a reference in the underlying object, and as users come and go, they increment and decrement that reference, and when it becomes zero, the object deallocates itself. They increment and decrement the counter. The counter within the object. It's, it's good... Uh, for simple objects and simple tree-like structures, it has difficulty when it gets into cycles where an object mm -hmm. points to another object, mm. which then points back again, and those reference counts can never get to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not used as a basis for more sophisticated allocation schemes. So, so and, and obviously reference counting is something you'd have to care about if you don't have automatic garbage collection. Yes. If you still want to not really do it manually in your application in C++, for example, you'll have smart pointers, which then if you deallocate this pointer on the stack, it down count, uh, decreases the, the counter of the object it's pointing to. Yes, in C++, the destructor is the place where you Exa do yeah, that right. yeah, 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 dereference yeah, yeah, yeah. reference count. And garbage collection is probably something for a different episode, maybe because it's a huge topic, I, I guess. It is a huge topic, and I'll, I'll um, mention the book on the topic is uh, Richard Jones' book on garbage collection, uh, which is, I think there'll be a link to it in the in the podcast site. Maybe get him for an interview at some well, point. I think he'd be certainly interesting to <laughs> yeah, talk to. Um, the reason we put it here, though, is a lot of people think garbage collection is something that you have to be an absolute expert to implement, and chances are it's only going to be done in your Java VM and doesn't make sense for mm. C++. Mm, 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 mm. And basically, we think that all of these things are false. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you're trying to build a highly optimized, highly efficient garbage collector, yeah, you do have to be an expert. But... If you are in a situation where you have a bunch of objects of different sizes and different kinds that are being allocated and deallocated, uh, perhaps user objects, perhaps you know things on a mobile phone, and you've got some kind of interrelationships between them, so you know you've got mail messages attachments this, in, in some kind of non-tree structure, mm. it isn't actually that hard to implement a simple mark sweep garbage collector. Mm. It isn't that hard to implement a simple copying garbage collector. Uh, you can do it certainly in um, in C or in C++. And there are times when that's actually the right thing to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's move on to uh, chapter number three, which would be the small architecture patterns, right? Three, compression. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, of course. He who can read has a big advantage. So, yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> it says three compression. So let's talk about number it three. It three compression. Yes. I thought it did, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, whatever. Yes. <laughs> okay, moving, moving on. Um, we identified... Compression as being one of the big things that people use, and this is this is more at a functionality level where mm -hmm. you're talking about the bigger functionality. You have to know you're doing compression within an application. Yeah, um, and I was quite surprised to find out that the the whole science of compression turns out to be relatively straightforward to understand, if stunningly difficult to implement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, And we identified only three real forms of compression, which I suppose go as sort of easy, moderately easy, and difficult. Mm. <laughs> um, so the simplest one is table compression, um, which where you are fundamentally saying, well, I think I noticed that certain objects are more co – certain patterns, patterns are yeah. more common if you're compressing text – Certain patterns are more common than other patterns, so I shall use different lengths of um, bits to encode the simple ones. For example, I might encode E using two bits in English, um, and you know, use 10 bits perhaps to encode some peculiar character with, with an accent on it that never gets used. Mm -hmm. um, and Huffman encoding is, works in exactly this way. Mm -hmm. You need a table built in somewhere, either known by both the compressor and decompressor, so either hard-coded, or as gzip does it, you actually put the table into the beginning of the compressed data. Yeah. And the table contains what? The table contains the map of, if I have character A, I'm going to use bit 
sequence right. so and so. Mm-hmm. If I have character B, I'm going to use bit yeah. sequence. So, so what you basically do is you 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 take these reoccurring things, put them into one place, and store them physically only once, and yes. then you encode the real data structure as a sequence of like keys that point to that table with the idea that the keys are shorter than the data itself. Indeed, yes. Otherwise, it doesn't make much sense. Yeah. So it's like a form of encryption, your yeah, simple yeah, yeah. simple substitution cipher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But with a different purpose. Yeah, okay. Um, do you remember difference coding? So different difference coding is really quite straightforward. If you've got a sequence of data items, say a sequence of prices or a sequence of numbers, rather than sending all the data every time, you just list the differences. Mm. Okay? So... You know, you could, the simplest one is an arithmetic difference between the new numbers. You just subtract that, and then you code the difference uh, into, you know, pack basically the difference uh, into a smaller number of bits using some kind of packed data. And if you want, you can send an escape code to say, okay, look, here is an absolute value mm. because it's changed so much or to resynchronize yep. the, uh, the data stream. A variant of that is um, when you have sequences that are the same, you can send them as... Run length encoding? Run length encoding, right, okay. indeed. I was thinking about that which when is, I saw difference coding. Which is commonly used in, most commonly used in the TIFF and the FACTS right. image coding. Yeah. But then if you think about the way things like SyncML work, um, if you're syncing your phone or something, mm-hmm. that's effectively doing difference coding as well. It's saying rather than sending the entire contents of your memory mm. um, or storing the entire contents of your memory, we'll just store the stuff that's most recently changed. Mm. And you need probably some kind of primary key or identifier in that case to say, this is the thing that has changed. That's right. In that case, you do. And, you know, this is the thing that has changed and perhaps even, and these are the fields of the things that have changed. Mm. Mm. Do we talk about adaptive or do we... Well, adaptive compression is the use of more sophisticated compression algorithms than we've two we talked about. Uh, the good news is we have a suggested implementation strategy, which is basically go buy one of these things. <laughs> yeah. uh, given that's the implementation Gosh. strategy, once again, um, for some reason, this is something in some area of computer scientists that New Zealanders seem particularly keen on. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ian Witten and Tim Bell have a couple of books. Managing Gigabytes is one that, once again, go into these kind of things if you want to know how these algorithms are implemented in great detail um, if you don't uh, you can generally get a zip or either some patented or non-patented compression algorithm and just yeah. go directly to that yeah okay so that brings us to the secondary storage discussion Yes, and secondary storage is so familiar to us that we tend to take it for granted really mm. as a way of saving RAM memory um, but we found when we looked at it that there, there were a number of very different techniques um, which are in use. The simplest possible one is so blindingly obvious you probably don't notice it, which is application switching, that you don't have all your applications running at one time. Yeah. Um, in the uh, Palm environment, for example, an app, or the early Symbian environments, an application would save its entire state in such a way that you could go to another application and then come back to it, and you were still doing precisely the same thing mm. in certain limits mm. as um, as it as it was when you went away. Mm-hmm. So it appears that the application is running all the time, mm. but actually it switched out and back yeah. again. Yeah. 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 Um, but of course, in um, in any environment, a, a more crude version of it is that that you just don't try and run all your software at once. You don't run all your processes at once. Yeah. You simply run the ones that you actually need. Mm. So then the next couple of techniques here are relatively straightforward. So, you know, keep your data in secondary storage, in flash. Chances are you don't, you don't have a disk these days, but in flash or even in the ROM, in some kind of resource files, and then have a mechanism for just loading the parts you need yeah. out of those things into main memory if you can't access them directly. I mean, it's nice increasingly with flash memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, can be used as ROM and as persistent storage. ROM and, and, you know, and maybe even you can address it directly, mm-hmm. uh, but you can get it in that way. Yeah. And similarly, you have data files, which way back in the dear old days of tape processing, you could even you know, take your file one, one bit at a time and then process it sequentially. Yeah. And of course, the whole uh, pipes and filters model mm-hmm. that Unix uses so much and other environments imitate is also based entirely on sequential processing of data files. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
there's I mean there's any amount of of stuff and and facilities available to um, on the handling of data files it's 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 probably the story of data files is probably the story of computational engineering as we understand it yeah yeah moving on there are there's the possibility of packages which in practice in most environments we think of as dynamic link libraries of one sort or ah, another okay so this is the the capability to load within the context of an application the data that you actually need at a particular point although in that case data might also be program that's what dlls do right so the idea here is that you'll divide up your divide up your application into a bunch of these packages or these dlls and you will ensure you only load the package you need for whatever you're doing at mm. the same time. So yep. in some sense, it's like application switching, but being done within an application. On a smaller granularity on, on level. On a smaller granularity. And that leads us to the last pattern, um, which is paging. Mm. And once again, you might think, well, how on earth are you going to page on a small device? Um, we don't have the hardware for it, and you have to be an operating system egghead in order to do paging. Yeah. And once again, the interesting thing is the answer is you can still do these kind of things in software, if you need to, do you always need to do paging? Almost certainly not. Yeah. But there are times where you've got a lot of data that you've put on secondary storage, uh, where it needs to be accessed relatively randomly. And essentially all you do is you, you know, using pooled allocation or something, you allocate a bunch of buffers. Yep. You write your code so that it transparently has some way of saying, I need this particular data item, I'll lock that into this cache, expecting that I will release it as soon as I'm done. Mm. And uh, and then you simply have a, a paging system which you know m just manages that cache. So whenever there's a request for an item, if it's already there in the cache, you return it, and if it's not, you evict one of the things out of the cache. You can do copy on write or some kind of write marking if you like. If you've got storage, you can write back to. Um, and then replaces it with the, the thing the program needs. Although, if, if I look at some of these patterns, then some of them are kind of lend themselves to be implemented by an OS or, or a runtime system, like, for example, garbage collection, paging, um, things like um, compaction, where you have to update the references. It's nice if your infrastructure does that for you. Yes, and certainly you don't want to duplicate it if your right. infrastructure <laughs> yes. does it. I mean, once again, I should say for the skeptical, if you are... If if you don't believe us about paging, I refer you to the implementation we have on it on the website. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. <coughs> That's going to get deleted, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Although one of the jokes of podcast folks is that people talk some rubbish, they say, oh, we'll delete that, and then we'll leave it in, of course, including the sentence that we'll delete it. So, and even, and to, to, to get that even more meta, we could even leave this discussion about deleting stuff that we then won't delete in the podcast. And then people will say it's probably because of this James Noble again that there is only crap on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, that, I think that's really important because in some sense the most important technique that in the small architecture patterns in our book is the simplest way to make something small is just to leave stuff out. Yeah, that's actually... I don't see that pattern here. Well, that's because in the, in the book, the, each chapter, in fact, has an overall discussion. So, you know, the memory allocation talks about the general issues of memory allocation. And small architecture says, well, how can you manage memory use across a whole system, make every component responsible for its own memory use? And the simplest way to get that down is then do without the components that, mm -hmm. you know, you really don't need. Yeah, yeah. Which was a really very elegant uh, introduction or, 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 you know, transformation transfer to the small architecture section, which, by the way, as a feedback for your slides that we use here, it doesn't say one in front of the small architecture. That is shocking. Yeah. You, you uh, left it away in order to save memory, I guess. It was in order to, yes, yeah. have so, space for the bullet point. So, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. that's, right, that's the only <laughs> bullet point. <laughs> okay, so let's discuss small architecture. Yes. Um, so, and a particular interesting feature about leaving out is how much it is in fact done but this is you know if you have a look at pocket pc versus microsoft windows mm -hmm. um you have a look at the symbian um equivalents versus you know their their um laptop desktop equivalents you'll find that that quite deliberately there is there is a lot of functionally le functionality left out mm -hmm. such as well, I don't believe there's an entire grammar checker for uh, either mm -hmm. of the word environments, um, and so on and so forth. It's, the reason for that is probably memory. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I'm not saying it's certainly memory. It might be just they couldn't be bothered. But. Yeah, and it's not so much about the memory in order to run this thing, but in order to store all the information that it's needed. The storage obviously. and the memory to run it, yes. Mm. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of the patterns in small architecture, I guess. So we'll start again from the, the basic idea here, which, you know, in some sense is uh, Rebecca Wiesbrock's notion of responsibility. Um, where components take responsibility for doing things. And what, what, what we're saying here is when you're designing the architecture of your system, mm. you should think about this as components not only taking responsibility for their functional behavior, mm. but also take responsibility for their memory use. Yeah. And then you, know, you can see patterns here. So the first pattern that you, one could actually implement here is memory limit, mm. which says, okay, a components taken responsibility, it should only use a certain amount of memory. How can it you know, enforce that responsibility? Mm. And basically what you do is you set some kind of limit for each component and then just don't let it allocate more memory mm. uh, than it's been granted. But that would mean that the allocation infrastructure has to know who allocates memory. So you'd have to pass on like this pointer and says, hey, it's me, I want more memory. Well, perhaps. So, you know, the point is that the memory allocation patterns we talked about earlier then can be used in the context so of this limit. So you would give a fixed allocated area to each component? You could give a fixed allocated area to each component or, once again, on a number of operating systems, you know, there are various ways of managing heaps for variable allocation or for any of the other patterns. Although I would add that in practice this, is, this seems to be done more by measurements once off or by, you know, than by actual having a technical way yeah. of doing it. So, so you will say, you can have so much memory, how much are you actually using, get it down, and then we'll go on to the So you, you basically you run it, you simulate it, you check what it does, and then based on this, you try to convince people to change their code to make it smaller. Exactly. And I, I have certainly seen this done over months in a mobile phone implementation mm. for the whole, you know, of the whole phone, where yep. each component, therefore, is an application or something. You can measure the heap size, but in fact, that's not so much what's important. Mm. Um, what's important is measuring the overall and deciding in which bits you are going to trim yep. and how in order to do it. Small interfaces. That sounds interesting. It's rather fun. I this is this this is quite close to my heart at the moment. I was just defining an API between a user interface component and a an engine component the other day and I realized just how much the choices I was making affected how much memory needed to be allocated and where it was kept. So it's not about making the interface small in the sense that it has its fewer operations. No, this is about making the interface small so that its demands on system memory are small. Let me give an example, uh, a slightly contrived example. But supposing I was passing a photograph between two components. Mm. And I had a function, I wrote the function that said, okay, I pass this, this component to you, you must make a copy of the photograph. That forces there to be in the system two copies mm. of that photograph data. Not probably a desirable thing to happen in an environment that's, that has very limited memory. No. In order for me to make sure I've understood that, um, being the proxy for our listeners, um, mm -hmm. uh, would it also mean that if I, for example, want to display a big image and I only have a small screen in order to transfer the whole image I would only have an API that allows me to transfer parts of it. Same is true for maybe some kind of ch list box where you'd only lazily transport the data. So the interface would be different because you'd have to be able to request chunks instead of just the big whole thing. Yes, and then the implementation of the uh, the code that's delivering the interface could perhaps just get it out of disk. It doesn't even mm -hmm. have to store it. Yes. So So again... There's, there's a higher level design in terms of the functionality not requiring too much mm. and that there's a detailed design in the sense that by choosing the way that you define function signatures, you can make considerable differences to the amount of memory that must be stored. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of these just come down to being explicit about what memory needs to be transferred you know, across the API mm. Uh, and in some sense how the ownership of that memory can yeah, be transferred. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for the photograph, possibly the way you do is, you know, there are at least three options, one of which is that you allow the other component to borrow the memory you've allocated. So you, you have basically have a pointer into the other memory. You give, yeah. you give someone a pointer and you give them permission 
even after the API call has finished, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. to continue to access that. Okay, now at this point, maybe then the component you're sending it to has to be able to come back and say, oh, by the way, I've finished with that photo. Mm, because the other one must not shut down and discard its memory because it's kind of used by somebody else. That's right. Through the back door. That's right. Um, another one is you could do it the other way where the second component actually allocates the memory itself and then the first component writes something into it and then is done. Um, right. And so, you know, once again, the memory is transferred. Um, But now it's like physically part of the using component. Right, right, right. So the memory is physically part of the using component. Or you could have reference counting, in which case you're mm. putting the reference counting into the API. Um, there's an interesting, even more twisted version of doing this, which I've seen uh, done in a couple of things, where basically the deal is you swap memory blocks. So you exchange them or what? You can exchange the memory blocks. Yeah. So the deal is uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you something in a memory, and I'm going to give you a memory block, and mm. this works with fixed size blocks. And the deal is the API is such that when I do that, you're going to give me a memory block that you no longer want. Yeah. Yeah. So streaming audio, for example, will do this. So I say, here's a, here's a block of data, and I'm going to give you, I don't know, 10K of memory, and the data's in this 10K block. And would you please give me back another 10K block that you mm -hmm. no longer want? Mm -hmm. Hmm, cool, but but that means that um, I can't easily use, for example, fixed fixed allocation where I know I have this continuous memory area because now parts of this one of my memory might actually belong to you because I exchanged it with some other stuff. So it makes things a bit more complicated. Which is why it's done in terms of blocks rather than a mm -hmm. memory area. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a more detailed thing which it's worth looking at every day, um, making sure, for example, that an API doesn't require one component to hang on to memory that really it doesn't need anymore mm. just because of the allocation. This is less of a problem in Java, which, of course, manages references directly. But in C++, if I, if I return a string by, as a reference in some way, and it's quite common in C and C++ yeah. to do this, then you're forcing the component that delivered the string to hang on to it as we said before, until it's, uh, you know, until it's no longer needed. Mm -hmm. And that can, that can require additional memory allocation in quite, quite a significant way. Which comes back to our original idea of saying you want to make a components responsible for their own memory use, mm -hmm. which means designing interfaces so that if stuff needs to be transferred, the responsibility for that memory it's can also be transferred, transferred along yeah. with it. Yeah, yeah. So there is a pattern that's called Captain Oats. This one is Charles's favorite. Definitely. It's, it's part of the mythology... I'm just going outside and I may be some time. <laughs> part of the mythology of, of the English culture is the story of an unsuccessful um, trip to the South Pole done by Scott. And... And as they, were, as they were limping back home, it was clear that the team were not going to survive. At least they hadn't food to keep everybody going. Mm. And the heroic Captain Oates, at some point, left, walked out of the tent saying, I'm just going out, I may be some time. And his sacrifice was to allow the others to live. Uh -huh. Or to die a little later. <laughs> As it turned out. <laughs> But never mind, it was heroic. It was heroic. Yeah, indeed. And, and this, the Captain Oates, is the concept of the heroic application or the heroic component <laughs> that gives up its memory in order that more interesting, more relevant or more important applications may live. So say you're writing the ubiquitous clock or, you know, the, <laughs> the ubiquitous animated screensaver that no self-respecting embedded system can be without. Um, often these, you know, and once again, often an operating environment will have a signal that goes goes through and says a low memory. Well, the simplest way to do that is, you know, for your clock just to go away and uh, let the memory be used by perhaps something more mission critical, like the the IM chat client or something. And I'm delighted to say that this is now an essential part of Symbian OS, and indeed, <laughs> it is built into the testing of every single application. Okay. Um, you cannot, you know, you cannot get an application passed by the Symbian testing process unless it gracefully gives up its when requested to do so, yeah. or unless you've got a good reason why not. Need some kind of like priority, so have to t t um, every component needs to have some definition of how important it is, so that people actually know who should give up things. Because I mean, otherwise you can't, you know, automatically determine who will sacrifice. Indeed, yes, yes. And that generally has to be done by the 
controller mm. that is responsible for looking at all these processes mm. and saying which one should I which yep. one should I kill. In practice, it's usually the foreground application that is the priority one. Another one, other processes may say, "I am. I really don't want to be stopped, please, by raising some kind of flag." But the principle behind the pattern is. If you're in this situation, and if you get some kind of low memory warning, you are better off saving your state nicely out to secondary storage or tidying up and quitting um, than mm. you are trying to try to fight it. Yeah. Okay. Um, read-only memory, I think, is interesting because in many embedded systems you have ROM, RAM, random access, fast, slow memory. So you would probably have different areas or kinds of memories that are, have different, you know. Some are important, expensive, some are. Certainly, read-only memory is, in effect, um, memory which is part of the code. That's the usual implementation of it. Right. Um, the other implementation is resource files when they are, or files that are held in a ROM filing system. Exactly, that's what I was talking yes. about. Yes. Yeah. So, so, in practice, for example, in Java, typically, the way you would do it is to have a table that is part of the code. Yeah. Um, although in practice the implementation may not be quite what you want. The actual code that it generates may not be quite what you want. Mm -hmm. um, in C++, certainly constant tables, for example, for decoding are quite a common idiom. Yeah. Um, constant strings are certainly yeah. used, um, and um, you know, Symbian is entirely built around mechanisms for storing those constant strings mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then i guess that segues nicely into the last pattern the one the only one we haven't talked about which yep. is hooks which essentially says and then if you're doing rom and you think you may want to replace or uh, change that information by putting in the ubiquitous another level of indirection some kind of hooks in writable storage um and if you put all access to the read-only memory through the hooks then you've got the option of um being able to update that information in Flash or in the main RAM um, without actually having people to burn or replace the ROMs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes, and that can be done in a variety of ways, um, from having files, you know, located, loaded, looked for first in RAM and only afterwards yeah. in ROM, mm -hmm. So, um, which is an idiom used quite often, again, in Symbian, mm -hmm. um, which means that you can override the ROM version of it Mm -hmm. but you won't want to most of the time. Okay, so um, this was the run-through through the book. Um, is there anything, I mean, which means we're almost basically finished with the interview. So is there anything else you want to you wanna say, like a couple of concluding words or whatever? I find I'm using these patterns quite a bit, mm -hmm. actually, in practice. Um, some many more than others. Uh, small interfaces probably most. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, I find it absolutely great that we're, you know, that this is becoming mainstream again. So the other thing, you know, we can see that this is, in fact, stuff that is still current because in their own separate ways, both, you know, companies like Microsoft and IBM and Sun are all looking at doing versions of their platforms for um, small memory. Yep. Uh, and in certain cases, also pushing things up into languages. So there's mm -hmm. things like the real-time spec for Java right. um, and the latest versions of Windows CE. And in fact, if you look at the systems, and this is actually something I, I find quite gratifying, if you look at the way the designs of the systems are evolving, um, they're evolving to support um, quite a lot of the patterns we've been talking about. So, you know, the RTSJ, for example, has got stuff in there to support fixed allocation and variable allocation, mm -hmm. although it's, it's currently difficult to use, and I think uh, people are working on that. And um, the, the Windows systems have got support in there for pooled allocation and, and memory discard and all those kind yeah. of things built in. Yeah, it's always sometimes this discussion in the patterns community, you know, how, how, how much pattern, how, how patterny a pattern really is. So how much, how much you know, how common is it? How, how generally is it usable? How generally is it, is it applicable? And it's quite obvious that these things are really, really fundamental ways of handling memory. So that's it's really cool stuff. Yes, indeed. Glad to be up there with the forefront. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Technology as in 1950. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I just want to say thank you because I think this was a really, really cool episode. I really liked it. <laughs> Maybe it makes up for the other one. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for being on the show. and Thank you very much, and it's been great to be here. Indeed so. 
for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.